Peachy Teal reading George Orwell's 1984. Syme had vanished. A morning came and he was missing from work. A few thoughtless people commented on his absence. On the next day, nobody mentioned him. On the third day, Winston went into the vestibule of the records department to look at the notice board. One of the notices carried a printed list of the members of the chess committee, of whom Syme had been one. It looked almost exactly as it had looked before. Nothing had been crossed out. But it was one name shorter. It was enough. Syme had ceased to exist. He had never existed. The weather was baking hot. In the labyrinthine ministry, the windowless, air-conditioned rooms kept their normal temperature, but outside the pavement scorched one's feet, and the stench of the tubes at the rush hours was a horror. The preparations for hate week were in full swing, and the staffs of all the ministries were working overtime. Processions, meetings, military parades, lectures, waxwork displays, film shows, telescreen programs all had to be organized. Stands had to be erected effigies built, slogans coined, songs written, rumors circulated, photographs faked. Julia's unit in the fiction department had been taken off the production of novels and was rushing out a series of atrocity pamphlets. Winston, in addition to his regular work, spent long periods every day in going through back files of the Times and altering and embellishing news items which were to be quoted in speeches. Late at night, when crowds of rowdy proles roamed the streets, the town had a curiously febrile air. The rocket bombs crashed oftener than ever, and sometimes, in the far distance, there were enormous explosions which no one could explain, and about which there were wild rumors. The new tune, which was to be the theme song of Hate Week, the Hate Song, it was called, had already been composed and was being endlessly plugged on the telescreens. It had a savage, barking rhythm which could not exactly be called music, but resembled the beating of a drum. Roared out by hundreds of voices to the tramp of marching feet, it was terrifying. The proles had taken a fancy to it, and in the midnight streets it competed with the still popular It Was Only a Hopeless Fancy. The Parsons' children played it at all hours of the night and day, unbearably, on a comb and a piece of toilet paper. Winston's evenings were fuller than ever. Squads of volunteers organized by Parsons were preparing the street for hate week, stitching banners, painting posters, erecting flagstaffs on the roofs, and perilously slinging wires across the street for the reception of streamers. Parsons boasted that Victory Mansions alone would display four hundred meters of bunting. He was in his native element and as happy as a lark. The heat in the manual work had given him a pretext for reverting to shorts and an open shirt in the evenings. He was everywhere at once— pushing, pulling, sawing, hammering, improvising, jollying everyone along with comradely exhortations, and giving out from every fold of his body what seemed an inexhaustible supply of acrid-smelling sweat. A new poster had suddenly appeared all over London. It had no caption, and represented simply the monstrous figure of a Eurasian soldier, three or four meters high, striding forward with expressionless Mongolian face and enormous boots, a submachine gun pointed from his hip. From whatever angle you looked at the poster, the muzzle of the gun, magnified by the foreshortening, seemed to be pointed straight at you. The thing had been plastered on every blank space on every wall, even outnumbering the portraits of Big Brother. The proles normally apathetic about the war were being lashed into one of their periodical frenzies of patriotism. As though to harmonize with the general mood, the rocket bombs had been killing larger numbers of people than usual. One fell in a crowded film theater in Stephney, burying several hundred victims among the ruins. The whole population of the neighborhood turned out for a long trailing funeral, which went on for hours and was in effect an indignation meeting. Another bomb fell on a piece of waste ground which was used as a playground, and several dozen children were blown to pieces. There were further angry demonstrations. Goldstein was burned in effigy. Hundreds of copies of the poster of the Eurasian soldier were torn down and added to the flames, and a number of shops were looted in the turmoil. 
Then a rumor flew around that spies were directing the rocket bombs by means of wireless waves, and an old couple who were suspected of being of foreign extraction had their house set on fire and perished of suffocation. In the room over Mr. Charrington's shop, when they could get there, Julia and Winston lay side by side on a stripped bed under the open window, naked for the sake of coolness. The rat had never come back, but the bugs had multiplied hideously in the heat. It did not seem to matter. Dirty or clean, the room was paradise. As soon as they arrived, they would sprinkle everything with pepper bought on the black market, tear off their clothes and make love with sweating bodies, then fall asleep and wake to find that the bugs had rallied and were massive for the counterattack. Four, five, six, seven times they met during the month of June. Winston had dropped his habit of drinking gin at all hours. He seemed to have lost the need for it. He had grown fatter, his varicose ulcer had subsided, leaving only a brown stain on the skin above his ankle. His fits of coughing in the early morning had stopped. The process of life had ceased to be intolerable. He had no longer any impulse to make faces at the telescreen or shout curses at the top of his voice. Now that they had a secure hiding place, almost a home, it did not even seem a hardship that they could only meet infrequently and for a couple of hours at a time. What mattered was that the room over the junk shop should exist. To know that it was there, inviolate, was almost the same as being in it. The room was a world, a pocket of the past where extinct animals could walk. Mr. Charrington thought Winston was another extinct animal. He usually stopped to talk with Mr. Charrington for a few minutes on his way upstairs. The old man seemed seldom or never to go out of doors, and on the other hand, to have almost no customers. He led a ghost-like existence between the tiny dark shop and an even tinier back kitchen where he prepared his meals, and which contained, among other things, an unbelievably ancient gramophone with an enormous horn. He seemed glad of the opportunity to talk. Wandering about among his worthless stock, with his long nose and thick spectacles and his bowed shoulders and the velvet jacket, he had always vaguely the air of being a collector rather than a tradesman. With a sort of faded enthusiasm, he would finger this scrap of rubbish or that, a china bottle stopper, the painted lid of a broken snuff-box, a pinchbeck locket containing a strand of some long-dead baby's hair, never asking that Winston should buy it, merely that he should admire it. To talk to him was like listening to the tinkling of a worn-out musical box. He had dragged out from the corners of his memory some more fragments of forgotten rhymes. There was one about four-and-twenty blackbirds, and another about a cow and a crumpled horn, and another about the death of poor Cock Robin. "'It just occurred to me you might be interested,' <laughs> he would say with a deprecating little laugh whenever he produced a new fragment. But he could never recall more than a few lines of any one rhyme. Both of them knew— in a way it was never out of their minds, that what was now happening could not last long. There were times when the fact of impending death seemed as palpable as the bed they lay on, and they would cling together with a sort of despairing sensuality, like a damned soul grasping at his last morsel of pleasure when the clock is within five minutes of striking. But there were also times when they had the illusion not only of safety, but of permanence. So long as they were actually in this room, they both felt no harm could come to them. Getting there was difficult and dangerous, but the room itself was sanctuary. It was as when Winston had gazed into the heart of the paperweight, with the feeling that it would be possible to get inside that glassy world, and that once inside it, time could be arrested. Often they gave themselves up to daydream of escape. Their luck would hold indefinitely, and they would carry on their intrigue, just like this, for the remainder of their natural lives. Or Catherine would die, and by subtle maneuverings Winston and Julia would succeed in getting married. Or they would commit suicide together. Or they would disappear, alter themselves out of recognition, learn to speak with proletarian accents, get jobs in a factory, and live out their lives undetected in a back street. It was all nonsense, as they both knew. In reality, there was no escape. Even the one plan that was practicable, suicide, they had no intention of carrying out. 
to hang on from day to day and from week to week, spinning out a present that had no future, seemed an unconquerable instinct, just as one's lungs will always draw the next breath so long as there is air available. Sometimes, too, they talked of engaging in active rebellion against the party, but with no notion of how to take the first step. Even if the fabulous brotherhood was a reality, there still remained the difficulty of finding one's way into it. He told her of the strange intimacy that existed, or seemed to exist, between himself and O'Brien, and of the impulse he sometimes felt, simply to walk into O'Brien's presence, announce that he was the enemy of the party, and demand his help. Curiously enough, this did not strike her as an impossibly rash thing to do. She was used to judging people by their faces, and it seemed natural to her that Winston should believe O'Brien to be trustworthy on the strength of a single flash of the eyes. Moreover, she took it for granted that everyone, or nearly everyone, secretly hated the party and would break the rules if he thought it safe to do so. But she refused to believe that widespread organized opposition existed or could exist. The tales about Goldstein and his underground army, she said, were simply a lot of rubbish, which the party had invented for its own purposes, and which you had to pretend to believe in. Times beyond number, at party rallies and spontaneous demonstrations, she had shouted at the top of her voice for the execution of people whose names she had never heard, and in whose supposed crimes she had not the faintest belief. When public trials were happening, she had taken her place in the detachments from the Youth League, who surrounded the courts from morning to night, chanting at intervals, "'Death to the traitors!' During the two minutes' hate, she always excelled all others in shouting insults at Goldstein. Yet she had only the dimmest idea of who Goldstein was, and what doctrines he was supposed to represent. She had grown up since the Revolution, and was too young to remember the ideological battles of the fifties and sixties. Such a thing as an independent political movement was outside her imagination, and in any case the party was invincible. It would always exist." and it would always be the same. You could only rebel against it by secret disobedience or, at most, by isolated acts of violence, such as killing somebody or blowing something up. In some ways she was far more acute than Winston, and far less susceptible to party propaganda. Once when he happened in some connection to mention the war against Eurasia, she startled him by saying casually that in her opinion the war was not happening. The rocket bombs which fell daily on London were probably fired by the government of Oceania itself, just to keep people frightened. This was an idea that had literally never occurred to him. She also stirred a sort of envy in him by telling him that, during the two minutes' hate, her great difficulty was to avoid bursting out laughing. But she only questioned the teachings of the party when they in some way touched upon her own life. Often she was ready to accept the official mythology simply because the difference between truth and falsehood did not seem important to her. She believed, for instance, having learnt it at school, that the party had invented aeroplanes. In his own school days, Winston remembered, in the late fifties, it was only the helicopter that the party claimed to have invented. A dozen years later, when Julia was at school, it was already claiming the aeroplane one generation more, and it would be claiming the steam engine. And when he told her that aeroplanes had been in existence before he was born, and long before the Revolution, the fact struck her as totally uninteresting. After all, what did it matter who had invented aeroplanes? It was rather more of a shock to him when he discovered from some chance remark that she did not remember that Oceania, four years ago, had been at war with East Asia, and at peace with Eurasia. It was true that she regarded the whole war as a sham, but apparently she had not even noticed that the name of the enemy had changed. "'I thought we'd always been at war with Eurasia,' she said vaguely. It frightened him a little. The invention of aeroplanes dated from long before her birth, but the switchover in the war had happened only four years ago, well after she was grown up. He argued with her about it for perhaps a quarter of an hour. In the end he succeeded in forcing her memory back until she did dimly recall that at one time East Asia and not Eurasia had been the enemy. But the issue still struck her as unimportant. 
Who cares? she said impatiently. It's always one bloody war after another, and one knows the news is all lies anyway. Sometimes he talked to her of the records department and the impudent forgeries that he committed there. Such things did not appear to horrify her. She did not feel the abyss opening beneath her feet at the thought of lies becoming truths. He told her the story of Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford, and the momentous slip of paper which he had once held between his fingers. It did not make much impression on her. At first, indeed, she failed to grasp the point of the story. "'Were they friends of yours?' she said. "'No, I never knew them. They were inner-party members. Besides, they were far older men than I was. They belonged to the old days, before the Revolution. I barely knew them by sight.' Then what was there to worry about? People are being killed off all the time, aren't they? He tried to make her understand. This was an exceptional case. It wasn't just a question of somebody being killed. Do you realize that the past, starting from yesterday, has been actually abolished? If it survives anywhere, it's in a few solid objects with no words attached to them, like that lump of glass there. Already we know almost literally nothing about the Revolution in the years before the Revolution. Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book has been rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street and building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And that process is continuing, day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. I know, of course, that the past is falsified, but it would never be possible for me to prove it, even when I did the falsification myself. After the thing is done, no evidence ever remains. The only evidence is inside my own mind, and I don't know with any certainty that any other human being shares my memories. Just in that one instance, in my whole life, I did possess actual, concrete evidence after the event, years after it. And what good was that? It was no good, because I threw it away a few minutes later. But if the same thing happened today, I should keep it. Well, I wouldn't, said Julia. I'm quite ready to take risks, but only for something worthwhile, not for bits of old newspaper. What could you have done with it, even if you had kept it? Not much, perhaps, but it was evidence. It might have planted a few doubts here and there, supposing that I dared to show it to anybody. I don't imagine that we can alter anything in our own lifetime, but one can imagine little knots of resistance springing up here and there, small groups of people banding themselves together and gradually growing and even leaving a few records behind so that the next generation can carry on where we leave off. I'm not interested in the next generation, dear. I'm interested in us. You're only a rebel from the waist downwards, he told her. She thought this brilliantly witty and flung her arms around him in delight. In the ramifications of party doctrine, she had not the faintest interest. Whenever he began to talk of the principles of Ingsoc, double-think, the mutability of the past and the denial of objective reality, and to use newspeak words, she became bored and confused, and said that she never paid any attention to that kind of thing. One knew that it was all rubbish, so why let oneself be worried by it? She knew when to cheer and when to boo, and that was all one needed. If he persisted in talking of such subjects, she had a disconcerting habit of falling asleep. She was one of those people who can go to sleep at any hour and in any position. Talking to her, he realized how easy it was to present an appearance of orthodoxy, while having no grasp whatever of what orthodoxy meant. In a way, the world view of the party imposed itself most successfully on people incapable of understanding it. They could be made to accept the most flagrant violations of reality, because they never fully grasped the enormity of what was demanded of them and were not sufficiently interested in public events to notice what was happening. By lack of understanding, they remained sane. They simply swallowed everything, and what they swallowed did them no harm, because it left no residue behind, just as a grain of corn will pass undigested through the body of a bird. Chapter 6 It had happened at last. 
The expected message had come. All his life, it seemed to him, he had been waiting for this to happen. He was walking down the long corridor at the ministry, and he was almost at the spot where Julia had slipped the note into his hand when he became aware that someone larger than himself was walking just behind him. The person, whoever it was, gave a small cough, evidently as a prelude to speaking. Winston stopped abruptly and turned. It was O'Brien. At last they were face to face, and it seemed that his only impulse was to run away. His heart bounded violently. He would have been incapable of speaking. O'Brien, however, had continued forward in the same movement, laying a friendly hand for a moment on Winston's arm, so that the two of them were walking side by side. He began speaking with the peculiar grave courtesy that differentiated him from the majority of inner party members. "'I had been hoping for an opportunity of talking to you,' he said. "'I was reading one of your Newspeak articles in the Times the other day. You take a scholarly interest in Newspeak, I believe.' Winston had recovered part of his self-possession. "'Hardly scholarly,' he said. "'I'm only an amateur. It's not my subject.' I have never had anything to do with the actual construction of the language. "'But you write it very elegantly,' said O'Brien. "'That is not only my own opinion. I was talking recently to a friend of yours who is certainly an expert. His name has slipped my memory for the moment.' Again Winston's heart stirred painfully. It was inconceivable that this was anything other than a reference to Syme. But Syme was not only dead, he was abolished.' an unperson. Any identifiable reference to him would have been mortally dangerous. O'Brien's remark must obviously have been intended as a signal, a code word. By sharing a small act of thought crime, he had turned the two of them into accomplices. They had continued to stroll slowly down the corridor, but now O'Brien halted. With the curious disarming friendliness that he always managed to put into the gesture, he resettled his spectacles on his nose, then he went on. What I had really intended to say was that in your article I noticed you had used two words which have become obsolete. But they have only become so very recently. Have you seen the tenth edition of the Newspeak Dictionary? No, said Winston. I didn't think it had been issued yet. We are still using the ninth in the records department. The tenth edition is not due to appear for some months, I believe. But a few advanced copies have been circulated. I have one myself. It might interest you to look at it, perhaps. Very much so, said Winston immediately, seeing where this tended. Some of the new developments are most ingenious. The reduction in the number of verbs? That is the point that will appeal to you, I think. Let me see. Shall I send a messenger to you with the dictionary? But I am afraid I invariably forget anything of that kind. Perhaps you could pick it up at my flat at some time that suited you. Wait, let me give you my address. They were standing in front of a telescreen. Somewhat absent-mindedly, O'Brien felt two of his pockets, and then produced a small leather-covered notebook and a gold ink pencil. Immediately beneath the telescreen, in such a position that anyone who was watching at the other end of the instrument could read what he was writing, he scribbled an address, tore out the page, and handed it to Winston. "'I am usually at home in the evenings,' he said. If not, my servant will give you the dictionary. He was gone, leaving Winston holding the scrap of paper, which this time there was no need to conceal. Nevertheless, he carefully memorized what was written on it, and some hours later dropped it in the memory hole, along with a mass of other papers. They had been talking to one another for a couple of minutes at the most. There was only one meaning that the episode could possibly have. It had been contrived as a way of letting Winston know O'Brien's address. This was necessary because, except by a direct inquiry, it was never possible to discover where anyone lived. There were no directories of any kind. "'If you ever want to see me, this is where I can be found,' was what O'Brien had been saying to him. Perhaps there would even be a message concealed somewhere in the dictionary. But at any rate, one thing was certain. The conspiracy that he had dreamed of did exist, and he had reached the outer edges of it. He knew that sooner or later he would obey O'Brien's summons. Perhaps tomorrow. Perhaps after a long delay. He was not certain. What was happening was only the working out of a process that had started years ago. The first step had been a secret, involuntary thought. The second had been the opening of the diary. 
He had moved from thoughts to words, and now from words to actions. The last step was something that would happen in the ministry of love. He had accepted it. The end was contained in the beginning. But it was frightening. Or, more exactly, it was like a foretaste of death like being a little less alive. Even while he was speaking to O'Brien, when the meaning of the words had sunk in, a chilly, shuddering feeling had taken possession of his body. He had the sensation of stepping into the dampness of a grave, and it was not much better because he had always known that the grave was there and waiting for him. If you've enjoyed this reading, please let me know by clicking the like button, subscribing, and hitting the notification bell so that you know when another story is available. Please visit peachybooks.ca to read my reviews and have some lively discussions about great books. Thanks for listening.